I am Jack Ducharme, represent House District 111, which is Madison, Norwich, and Solon. All right. Good morning. It's sort of like riding a bike, right? You just yeah. gotta hit that button and do it again. Representative Faye. Take myself off mute. <laughs> I'm Jessica Faye, I represent House District 66, which is parts of the towns of Casco, Poland, and Raymond. Representative Cardone. Hello, I'm Barbara Cardone. I represent House District 127, part of Bangor. Representative Corey. Good afternoon. I'm Patrick Corey, I represent House District 25, which is part of Wyndham. Representative Millett. Someone Millett, House District 71, towns of Norway, Sweden, Waterford, and West Paris. Representative Hymanson. Hello, I'm Patty Hymanson, representing House District 4, parts of York, Wells, Sanford, and all of Ogunquit. Representative Cloutier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am Representative Kristen Cloutier, and I represent House District 60, which is part of my hometown of Lewiston. Representative Arada. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Arada, and I represent House District 65, which includes New Gloucester and the other part of Poland. Representative Martin. Softer, the better. Oh. There it goes. Thank you. Uh, John Martin, House District 151, and from Allagash down to Fort Kent and down Route 11 to Oxbow. Senator Davis. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul Davis. I represent Senate District 4, which is all of Piscataquis County and parts of Somerset and Penobscot. Uh, Senator Bailey is uh, joining us remotely today, so she's not here, but she's listening in. Yep. Um, and my co-chair, Representative Purse. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Teresa Purse. I represent House District 44, which is the majority of Falmouth, and I'm honored to be the House Chair of AFA. And again, I'm Kathy Breen. I represent six and a half communities in Cumberland County. I serve as Senate Chair of Appropriations. And um, we have um, a supplemental budget that we have been working on that the administration um, presented to this committee um, back in February. We had a bunch of public hearings and then we had another revenue reforecasting report from the revenue forecasting committee. And so the uh, administration is here to present what we call a change package to the supplemental budget, which is an amendment to the amendment of the biennial budget. <laughs> so um, uh, we welcome back live and in person, Commissioner Figueroa. Nice to see you back in the room. And we have, uh, your testimony has been circulated to all of us. So we're ready to go when you are. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hello there. Would you like somebody else at the mic with you? No, no, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to see all of you and be seen in 3D, as it were. Good afternoon, Senator Breen, Representative Purse, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs. I am Kirsten Figueroa, the Commissioner of the Department of Administrative and Financial Services. I'm here today to present the Governor's Change Package for LD 1995, the fiscal year 22-23 Supplemental Budget Bill. The Change Package was crafted carefully and includes initiatives worked and supported by many of you and your peers. Thank you. The change package totaling approximately $411.7 million from the updated 2020, March 2022 revenue forecasting proposes to strengthen Maine's behavioral health system, bolster housing initiatives to fight homelessness, advance our support of those impacted by PFAS, 
and increase the amount of direct relief to Maine people in the face of inflation, among other things. The governor, was that me? <laughs> the governor's approach is purposely cautious and fiscally responsible. She has recognized both new revenue projections from the nonpartisan revenue forecasting committee, as well as new warnings from that committee whose members note significant long-term economic volatility and uncertainty in projections, especially in the out years, consistent with the commentary from fiscal experts across the globe. To that end, including the change package, the governor's supplemental budget proposal constrains net appropriations to 172 million of the 1.2 billion general fund surplus, dedicating more than 80% of the surplus to one-time initiatives and savings as a hedge against economic uncertainty rather than ongoing spending. She's built on her commitment to tackling the state's most pressing problems while also investing in solutions that will strengthen the state in the long-term. The governor's supplemental proposal aims to tackle the state's most pressing problems, including pandemic-driven inflation that is hurting the pocketbooks of Maine people and the state's long-standing workforce shortage, which is hampering the ability of employers to find employees. This proposal demonstrates our continued commitment to meeting the needs of Maine people and safeguarding the stability of state finances over the long term. It builds on the bipartisan budget agreement of last year, which finally delivers 55% education funding, restores full revenue sharing, replenishes the land for Maine's future program and provides a total of 371 million in relief to Maine people and businesses by providing relief to Maine people and tackling critical unmet needs across Maine, all while increasing savings and protecting against potential economic slowdowns of the future. It also complements the enacted Maine Jobs and Recovery Plan Maine's plan to use the American Rescue Plan Act funding to improve the lives of Maine people and families, help businesses create good paying jobs and build an economy poised for future prosperity. Before we begin reviewing initiatives, I'd like to familiarize everyone with the format of the change package document. At the top of the page, there's a header that indicates if we're adding or amending LD 1995, if the page indicates that we are amending it, could be that the initiative is being deleted or added, which will be indicated by a subheading or that it is revised. In the case where an initiative is being revised, the document will display what is currently in LD 1995, as well as the revised initiative. So we'll start on page one. This is a new initiative establishing one plant maintenance engineer one position in the Department of Administrative and Financial Services Bureau of General Services Buildings and Grounds Operations Account and appropriates 88,822 for the position. I left this out of the department's supplemental request and error and I thank the governor for including it in the change package. The work of these positions ensures the operation of the boilers and other heating and cooling equipment in our state owned facilities. Regulations require that qualified technicians be on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to ensure appropriate monitoring, some systems requiring at least every four hours. Based on the size, number, and age and state of our equipment, our small but mighty staff of nine operates at a deficit that requires frequent double shifts and no room for unanticipated or scheduled absences. The current staff are dedicated to their mission but are struggling with the overload of work. The staffing shortage is a safety issue for our staff and those who work or visit in our buildings and puts our regulatory compliance at risk. Moving to page two, the change package amends the funding within the COVID pandemic relief payment program. The program will promote the general welfare of the citizens of the state by providing COVID pandemic relief payments to eligible Maine citizens for reasonable and necessary unreimbursed expenses incurred as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic disaster, including pandemic induced inflation consistent with the governor's call that half of the additional revenue be returned to Maine people, the change package increases the state's relief checks from $510 to $850.
the governor's new proposal will return $1,700 in relief to the average Maine household, putting money back into their pockets during a time of rising costs due to inflation and rising oil and gas prices. The governor's proposal comes as the Office of the Maine State Economist est estimates that inflation will cost the average Maine person more than excuse me, more than $560 this year than last, including an extra $260 at the grocery store and $300 for gas and home heating oil. This $682 million initiative equates to 55% of the increased revenue recognized by Maine's Revenue Forecasting Committee in both the December 2021 and March 2022 forecasts. Additionally, we are proposing to allocate funding in both fiscal years 2022 and 2023, 300 million in fiscal year 22 and 382 million in fiscal year 23. Maine Revenue Services will begin issuing the disaster relief payments as soon as administrative, administratively feasible after enactment and no later than June of 2022. Language Part L on pages 14 through 16 of the language document amends the amount of funding transferred from unappropriated surplus of the general fund to this COVID pandemic relief payment program to support these payments. Pages three and four, update an initiative in the information services program, correcting the request from three public service manager three positions and one public service coordinator one to three public service manager two positions and one public service coordinator one position. The funding for the initiative was correct. The job titles were incorrect. Research shows that mature project management provides improvement in projects being completed on time within budget and in meeting original goals while avoiding scope creep. The next initiative on page five increases the allocation in the Harness Racing Commission based on the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. The allocation is increased by $905,035 in fiscal year 22 and by $263,120 in fiscal year 2023. Similar initiatives appear on pages 6, 7, 10, 12, 23, 25, 36, 42, 43, 45, and 50. Rather than reading the figures of each of the initiatives to you, we have provided a summary document of all the RFC related entries at the end of this testimony. I will show that document now. Page six. Adjust the allocation in the Milk Commission to align with projected revenues from the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. Page seven, adjust the allocation in the Off-Road Recreational Vehicles Program to align with projected revenues from the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. Page eight includes two initiatives in the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry Office of the Commissioner. Although it will prove in time to be widespread beyond Maine's borders, Maine is leading the nation in dealing with PFAS contamination. This also means that we are on the front edge of a very complex issue that science and federal policy has not caught up with in terms of guidance and support. At present, we are in the early stages of discovery and the resulting impacts of PFAS contamination on the lives of Maine's people, including understanding personal health exposure, levels of contamination in water, soils, and other mediums, and impacts to farm and business viability. We've heard compelling and frankly heart-wrenching testimony from many across the state about the impacts this has had and is having on hardworking families and their businesses. Along with our previous investments into this critical need, the administration and legislature have dedicated or proposed 46.4 million thus far to PFAS, including 30 million approved in the biennial budget for water systems and farmer assistance, 
5 million approved in the main jobs and recovery plan and 9.3 million proposed in the supplemental to build in-state lab capacity, including in our CDC HEDL lab and for additional farmers assistance and wildlife testing. This change package invests an additional 60 million as we acknowledge the need to initiate work in several new areas, including compensation to enable the relocation of farm businesses when remediation is not possible, monitoring the health of those with high levels of exposure to PFAS and its outcomes over time, and supporting research to better understand PFAS uptake and removal pathways. This funding will be overseen by a rigorous process and advisory board, which will be built out over the next several months. To assist with this very critical work, the change package adds one public service manager three and one public service coordinator one funded by the general fund to start the vast and complicated work as outlined above. The positions are established effective May 1, 2022 with 41,175 appropriated in personal services in 22 and $257,038 in fiscal year 2023. All other funding is provided in the general fund and the commissioner's office department-wide indirect other special revenue funds account. The second initiative on page eight allocates $60 million to the fund to address PFAS contamination to support the above described activities. Language part XX, which it's on its way to you. It was not a part of the original document as it's been finalized like right now, but it'll be coming soon. Transfers the funding from the unappropriated surplus of the general fund to the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry and establishes an advisory committee with representation from the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, Department of Environmental Protection, the Department of Health and Human Services, University of Maine, five members of the public representing the agriculture sector, one member from the public representing the financial sector, and one member of the public with expertise in public health. The intent of this committee is to develop and guide the uses of this funding with an open ear to public concern and input along the way. This language also provides the department with the authority and flexibility to start work while this advisory committee is established. In total, Maine has dedicated and proposed more than 106 million to address PFAS contamination. The administration will sample more than 700 sites where wastewater sludge has been spread, install drinking water treatment for all homes that have tested over Maine's drinking water standard for PFAS and require manufacturers to report PFAS content in all products sold into Maine beginning in January, 2023. Moving to page nine, the next initiative is in the Department of Corrections County Jail Operations Program. This initiative increases annual funding for the County Jail Operations Fund by 1.9 million in both fiscal years 2022 and 2023. The County Jail Operations Program has a current annual baseline budget of $18,442,104. This initiative provides funding to support the requested and necessary increases to the county jail budgets for operational and community corrections costs. Page 10 adjusts the allocation in the Department of Defense, Veterans and Emergency Management Veterans Services Program to align with projected revenues from the March 22, 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. There is one new initiative on page 11 for the Department of Economic and Community Development. This initiative appropriates 700,000 in the administration program to supplement other matching funds that will allow Maine to draw economic and workforce development monies from the American Rescue Plan Act. This funding will provide critical matching funds to help the University of Maine and the Rue Institute at Northeastern University receive transformative and strategic federal investments that will help to spur innovation and resilience in Maine's economy. UMaine and the Rue Institute are two of 60 finalists selected nationwide to advance to the second round out of more than 520 applicants nationwide. 
Each proposal is in direct alignment with the goals established in Maine's 10-year economic development strategy. Each of these proposals will need a 20% match to be eligible and will draw approximately 127 million in federal funds. The proposal leaders have been active in attracting match funds from a variety of options, including the private sector. The University of Maine initiative with a federal investment of $100 million aims to strengthen our forest economy by promoting growth of forest bioproducts. The investment will take advantage of changing consumer demand through redevelopment of industry industrial sites, investments in Maine's workforce, strategic investment and market attraction and more. This project estimates adding nearly $4 billion in economic impact to Maine's economy. The Rue Institute proposal would invest directly in bio manufacturing in Maine and across New England. There is more opportunity to help solve public health challenges and create economic opportunity in Maine by growing our life sciences sector. Maine would receive 27 million under the multi-state initiative. We now move to the Department of Education on page 12. The first initiative in a general purpose aid for local schools increases funding by $3.2 million in fiscal year 2023 on a one-time basis to support the increased cost of career and technical education materials and supplies. The cost of materials and supplies has increased significantly due to the COVID-19 pandemic, in some cases doubling or tripling. For example, in some cases, the cost of materials in hard trades, welding, metalworks, and construction has increased as much as 50% for steel and lumber. CTE schools are also competing with businesses and the general public for these items, as well as auto parts and plumbing and heating supplies, as there is not sufficient supply to meet the demand. These funds will be used to provide grants to CTE centers and regions to continue to purchase needed program materials and supplies. A revised Part C can be found on pages one through 10 of the language document. Specifically, Section C6 adds language authorizing the commissioner to expend and disperse funds to support one-time cost increases of instructional supplies for CTE centers and CTE regions. The second initiative in this account adjusts the allocation to align with projected revenues from the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. The next few initiatives deal with position adjustments. As Commissioner Macon mentioned to you when she testified on March 1st, the department's budget reflects a comprehensive organizational restructuring, mostly through reallocation of existing resources. The goal of this work included increasing both the effectiveness and the efficiency of the department to maximize its capacity for serving Maine schools. There were a few position changes left out of the original supplemental budget document. We have included those here in the change package. The net impact to the general fund for these changes is an increase of $31,571 in fiscal year 22 and $132,616 in fiscal year 2023. The initiative on page 13 is in the Higher Education and Educator Support Services Program. This initiative provides the funding for the approved reorganization of one Education Specialist II position to a Public Service Manager II position, increasing appropriation by $2,093 in fiscal year 22 and $13,623 in fiscal year 23. The next initiative on page 14 is in the leadership program, leadership team. This initiative provides funding for the proposed reorganization of one chief information, chief innovation officer position to a public service executive two position and transfers the position to the office of innovation. The initiative reduces funding in this program by $40,676 in fiscal year 22 and $163,236 in fiscal year 23. The corresponding increase in the Office of Innovation can be found on page 18. Next, there are two initiatives in the Learning Systems Team Program. The first on page 15 is a change in funding. 
This initiative transfers two positions from the general fund of the learning systems team program to the special services team and splits the position funding 50-50 between the general fund and federal expenditures fund within that program. The original initiative just transferred the positions within the general fund. The corresponding initiative is on page 20. Next is a new initiative on page 16 that continues one limited period management analyst two position through January 20, 2024. This position is funded with federal expenditures authorized through the American Rescue Plan. The initiative increases the allocation in fiscal year 2023 by $94,676. The position was previously continued by financial order and will end on May 23rd, 2023, if not included in the budget. Moving to page 17, there is one initiative in the Maine Commission for Community Service. This initiative continues one limited period senior planner position through February 20th, 2024. This position is funded with federal expenditures authorized through the American Rescue Plan. The initiative increases the allocation in fiscal year 2023 by $98,109. The position was continued previously by financial order and will end on October 18, 2022, if not included in the budget. The Office of Innovation is on page 18. The only initiative in this program is the transfer from the leadership team on page 14 that I referenced earlier. There is one initiative in the School Finance and Operations Program on page 19. This initiative provides funding for the approved reclassification of two Education Specialist one positions to two Education Specialist three positions. The initiative reduces allocation in the all other line category to fund the increases in personal services. The special services team program is on page 20. This is the other half of the entry refer referenced earlier in the learning systems team program on page 15 and reflects the proposed change to position funding from 100% general fund to 50% general fund and 50% federal expenditures fund. On page 21, there is one initiative in the Commission on Governmental Ethics and Election Practices. This initiative reallocates the cost of six positions totaling $171,172 in personal services and $107,821 in all other to the general fund from other special revenue funds. The current cost allocation resulted in an overcharge to the Maine Clean Election Fund which was established to finance the campaigns of candidates participating in the Maine Clean Election Act program and to pay administrative and enforcement costs of the commission related to that program. Currently, the Maine Clean Election Fund is subsidizing the general operations of the commission, which is contrary to the fund's statutory purpose and is reducing the amount of cash available for that purpose. The proposed reallocation would more appropriately split the agency's overhead costs such as technology, communications, service center services, and office rent between the general fund and the commission's other special revenue. The governor previously included a similar request as part of the 2021 supplemental budget submitted in February of 2020. Next, we will move on to the executive department on page 22. There is one initiative within the governor's office of policy innovation and the future to establish one public service coordinator two position and associated all other funding to support the coordination communication and activities of the governor's cabinet on aging. Governor Mills is convening a cabinet on aging to mobilize state government eliminate silos and enhance communication and coordination to ensure that every person in Maine may age safely, affordably in a way that best serves their needs. This position is structured similarly to that in Maine's children's cabinet. Page 23 adjusts the allocation in the Finance Authority of Maine's 
Dairy Improvement Fund program to align with projected revenues from the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. The next initiative is on page 24 and has accompanying language in part WW on pages 25 and 26 of the language document. This initiative and language establishes the Emergency Housing Relief Fund within Maine State Housing Authority and transfers $22 million from the unappropriated surplus of the general fund to the Maine State Housing Authority Emergency Housing Relief Fund other special revenue funds account. The funds may be used to provide rental assistance, supplement other programs addressing the needs of the homeless or those facing other immediate housing needs, supplement other short-term rental assistance programs, create additional supportive housing along the housing first model for people with disabilities, mental health challenges or substance use disorders and support other uses that will address immediate housing emergency challenges facing the state. The initiative on page 25 adjusts the allocation in the Mate State Housing Authority State Housing Authority program to align with projected revenues from the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. We will now move to the initiatives related to the Department of Health and Human Services. There are a number of appropriation and allocation adjustments associated with the Medicaid related tax accounts forecast by the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee. We include a summary document at the end of our testimony showing all. The impact is an increase to the general fund appropriations of $3,222,639 and a corresponding decrease to other special revenue allocations. The first of these is on page 26 in the Developmental Services Waiver Main Care Program. The next initiative is in the Disproportionate Share Dorothea Dix Psychiatric Center Program on pages 27 and 28 and funds the approved reclassification of one Office Specialist One position to a Secretary Specialist position with some general fund appropriation on page 27 and some other special revenue allocation on page 28. Page 29 includes one initiative in the Drinking Water Enforcement Program. This initiative provides $1,295,500 in fiscal year 2023 for a state match that would allow the state access to an additional $12,955,000 in federal dollars available through the Infrastructure Investment Act. Together, these state and federal dollars will fund approximately 15 additional public water system capital projects proposed by municipalities. Page 30 includes one initiative in the Medicaid Services Developmental Services Program related to the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. The next three initiatives propose an additional $19.7 million in state funding to address immediate needs in Maine's behavioral health system and support ongoing improvements to Maine care rates for behavioral health providers. The added funding will leverage 17.1 million in federal matching funds for a total of 36.8 million all funds, which more than doubles the total behavioral health funding proposed as part of the governor's supplemental budget. The proposal, which was developed in collaboration with legislators and behavioral health providers, supports children's residential care, assertive community treatment for those with severe and persistent mental illness, targeted case management, and outpatient therapy for children and adults through one-time supplemental payments and ongoing rate adjustments. There are two of these initiatives on page 31 in the main care medical, in the, in the medical care payments to providers program. The first provides one-time funding for a COVID-19 supplemental payment to assist children's residential care facilities under section 97, appendix D. The payments will be distributed in up to two different payments depending on the status of necessary federal approval. This initiative provides $2.8 million in general fund appropriation, $5.8 million in federal expenditures fund allocation, 
and $548,000 in other special revenue funds allocation for a total expected amount of $9,171,579. The second initiative on this page provides ongoing funding for the estimated cost of implementing behavioral health rate reforms pending the result of rate studies and to expand the opioid health home model to serve members with other substance use disorders, effective January 1, 2023. This initiative provides $4.6 million in general fund appropriation, $10.4 million in federal expenditures fund allocation, and $401,495 in other special revenue funds allocation for a total expected amount of $15,465,825. Funds will be prioritized to implement rate adjustments recommended from rate studies to home and community treatment and outpatient therapy under Section 65, assertive community treatment and targeted case management, and eligibility expansion for Section 93 opioid health homes. Appropriated funds that are not needed to implement changes for these specific services will be used to implement other eligibility expansion or rate increases based on rate studies for other services in sections 17, 28, 65, 92, and behavioral health services delivered in schools with priority given to crisis services. The third initiative found on page 32 in the Mental Health Services Community Program provides one-time funding for COVID-19 payments to home and community treatment under Section 65, assertive community treatment under Section 17, outpatient therapy for children and adults under Section 65, targeted case management under Section 14, and funds administrative costs. This initiative provides 12 $0.2 million in general fund appropriation in fiscal year 2022. Page 33 includes one initiative in the Mental Health Services Community Medicaid Program related to the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. There are two initiatives in the Nursing Facilities Program on page 34. The first initiative relates to the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. The second initiative provides a one-time supplemental payment to the main veterans homes in both fiscal year 2022 and 2023 to offset budget shortfalls. The initiative increases appropriations by $1 million oops, in fiscal year 2022 and by $750,000 in fiscal year 2023. The department anticipates federal approval for the supplemental payment to be received in fiscal year 2023, allowing for the payment to be matched with $1,545,668 in federal expenditures funds allocation. There is also an increase in other special revenue funds of $63,830 in fiscal year 22 and $146,532 in fiscal year 23. As a condition of receiving these funds, the Maine Veterans Homes commits to continuing to provide the current level of services in the Caribou and Machias homes. There is language related to this request in part SS on page 23 of the language document. Page 35 includes one initiative in the Office of Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Medicaid Seed Program related to the March 2022 revenue forecasting committee report. Moving to page 36, the one initiative in the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife adjusts the allocation in the ATV safety and educational program to align with projected revenues from the March 2022 revenue forecasting committee report. The judicial branch has requested that two initiatives on page 37 be deleted. This page removes the request for 50,000 in each year for the court alternative dispute resolution services contract and the one-time funding for increases in psychological and interpreter services in the amount of 445,000 in each fiscal year. Transitioning to the Department of Marine Resources. 
There is a new initiative on page 38 that funds the approved reclassification of one marine resource scientist two position to a marine resource scientist three position. The initiative increases general fund by $10,834 in fiscal year 22 and $11,211 in fiscal year 23 and increases other special revenue funds allocation by $4,446 in fiscal year 22 and by $4,600 in fiscal year 2023. Pages 39 and 40 in the Bureau of Policy and Management Program relate to litigation costs in defense of the state's lobster fishery. Page 39 deletes the supplemental initiative of a $980,000 appropriation. Instead, turning to page 40, this initiative provides an other special revenue fund allocation of $3 million with 1 million in fiscal year 22 and 2 million in fiscal year 23. This allocation is supported by the transfer of unappropriated surplus included on part, in part UU on page 24 of the language document. This part requires a transfer of $3 million on or before June 30th, 2022 from the unappropriated surplus of the general fund to the Department of Marine Resources, Bureau of Policy and Management, Lobster Fisheries Litigation Fund, other special revenue fund account. Maine's lobster fishery, which produces over $1.5 billion in annual revenue for the state is being threatened by ongoing federal litigation. The department is requesting this one-time transfer to support the increase in legal services related to pending litigation in the federal court regarding the protection of right whales and the authorization of the Maine lobster fishery by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The state's continued participation on behalf of the industry as a whole is critical as these cases constitute an existential threat to the fisheries survival. This funding will support the department's intervener status in two active cases, as well as involvement in related litigation for the foreseeable future and to appeal any possible adverse decisions as necessary. Any unused funds would revert to the general fund on July 1, 2032. It is important to note that there are two separate and distinct requests for funding to support litigation costs related to right whale regulations and the lobster industry. A bill was passed by the Marine Resources Committee that would reimburse the legal fees of two trade associations, the Maine Lobstermen's Association and the Maine Lobstering Union, who represent their members in the same cases DMR is engaged in. The request before you today is for the state's participation. DMR's role in this litigation is unique as they are the management agency responsible for protection of the resource acting on behalf of the entire lobster industry and the state's interests as a whole. On page 41 of the change package, there are two initiatives in the Bureau of Public Health, still in marine resources. The first initiative provides general fund of $11,217 in fiscal year 22 and $8,220 in fiscal year 23 for the approved reclass of one lab technician three position to a microbiologist two position. This is retroactive to January 22, 2021. The second initiative provides general fund of $26,342 in fiscal year 22 and $18,178 in fiscal year 23 for the approved reclass of two lab technician three positions to microbiologist two positions. These are retroactive to November 30th, 2020. Page 42 adjusts the allocation in the Maine Maritime Academy Scholarship Fund Dash Casino program to align with projected revenues from the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. And page 43 adjusts the allocation in the Department of Public Safety's Gambling Control Board program to align with projected revenues from the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. Moving on to the Secretary of State, page 44 includes one initiative which provides funding to study, develop, and conduct post-election audits. 
This also provides funding to develop and deploy training for the municipalities. This initiative will establish an audit and training division under the Bureau of Corporations, Elections and Commissions within the Department of the Secretary of State. This division would build upon our success in Maine and be tasked with analyzing and evaluating our current election processes and systems and developing a post-election audit process, which will incorporate best practices and a review of security protocols related to hardware, software, and paper ballots. Additionally, this initiative will make it possible for the department to develop robust training presentations and materials for municipal clerks. The Secretary of State received feedback from many clerks across the state requesting additional and more frequent training, especially given increasing retirements and turnover of local election officials. Our municipal clerks are on the front lines of our elections and it is imperative they have the necessary support to administer elections. Page 45, adjust the allocation in the Maine Community College System Board of Trustees program to align with projected revenues from the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. Page 46 deletes the request for additional debt service funding for the Office of the State Treasurer. The Office of the State Treasurer has updated the debt service dashboard based on actual requests for the spring bond sale. When the budget request was created, the dashboard assumed a sale of 150 million. This figure is updated to a to just under 100 million based on the plans submitted by the departments. The updated debt service dashboard is attached to the end of this testimony. Pages 47 and 48 update the allocations in the Office of the State Treasurer's Disproportionate Tax Burden Fund and State Municipal Revenue Sharing Accounts. There was an error in the dis distribution of funding between the two revenue sharing accounts in the supplemental budget document. There are two steps in calculating the amount of funding available for revenue share in two, or otherwise known as disproportionate tax burden fund. Pursuant to Title 36, Section 700-A, there is a transfer each year of 4 million, and pursuant to 30-A, Section 5681, the disproportionate tax burden fund receives 20% of the funding in the local government fund. The revised amounts in the governor's change package for LD 1995 correct that error, as well as address the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. The allocation including adjustment for tax proposals in parts E through H and both December 2021 and March 2022 Revenue Forecast reports results in total revenue sharing of approximately $213 million in fiscal year 2022 and 235.3 million in fiscal year 2023. There are two initiatives in the University of Maine system. The first initiative on page 49 provides $3 million to the Maine Economic Improvement Fund in fiscal year 2023. This funding will leverage the University of Maine's new R1 Carnegie classification and expand university research development and commercialization activity and increase paid student research learning experiences and external investment in support of statewide workforce and economic development needs. Investments in this main economic improvement fund leverages external grants and contracts at a rate of more than five to one. Consistent with the 10 year state economic development strategy, this fund activities help develop needed talent for main employers and grow wages, catalyze private sector partnerships and innovation, and attract and retain talent, business, and external investment to the state. The last initiative on page 50 adjusts the allocation in the University of Maine Scholarship Fund program to align with projected revenues from the March 2022 Revenue Forecasting Committee report. Finally, there is an adjustment to one entry in Part B. As a reminder, Part B includes self-funded reclassifications. The descriptions do not appear in the budget bill, but a correction to the description was updated within the budget system. There is no change to the dollar amount. We can now move to the language document. 
we have touched on a significant portion of the language as we went through the initiatives. Part C on pages one through 10 updates the language to authorize the Commissioner of Education to disperse the $3.2 million to support one-time cost increases of instructional supplies for career and technical education centers and CTE regions. Part H on pages 10 through 14 of the language document still replaces the current complicated education opportunity income tax credit with a clear, broader and simpler credit. The new credit is fully refundable and equal to the amount of loan payments made directly by the taxpayer to the student loan lender during the taxable year plus the amount of any carryover allowed. The change package increases the maximum per year to up to 2,500. This is an increase over the originally proposed 2,000. The credit applies to taxable years beginning on or after January 1, 2022. The simpler and broader tax credit is a better approach to assisting taxpayers in paying their student loans and in keeping and attracting workers to the state. As I noted earlier in my testimony, the governor proposes to increase the amount of funding available for the COVID pandemic relief payment program. Part L on pages 14 through 16 updates the proposed transfer from $411 million to $682 million, increasing the amount of the checks from $510 to $850 for an estimated 800,000 Mainers. As noted during my public testimony on February 28th, we have revised part BB on pages 16 through 19 to incorporate the amendment developed with the HHS committee relating to the child welfare ombudsman program. The revised part B adds the ombudsman or their designee as a member of the child death and serious injury review panel and requires that panel to submit a report every two years to the Joint Standing Committee of the Legislature having jurisdiction over health and human services matters beginning January 2023. All other components of the language remain the same. Part II adjusts the timing and the transfer from the inland fisheries and wildlife carrying balance to the resource management services Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Program to provide matching funds for the construction of the Freiburg shoot-in range. The transfer is changed from on or before June 1, 2022 to on or after July 1, 2022, but no later than August 1, 2022. That's on page 20. Part NN on pages 20 and 21 of the language document is updated to provide additional specificity on the payment to retirees. Who is covered? Retirees from state sponsored retirement plans who were eligible for a cost of living adjustment in September 2021. How the payment will be calculated. The payment is based on the difference between the Consumer Price Index for All Urban Consumers, CPIU, for the year ending June 30th, 2021, which is 5.4%, and the maximum cost of living adjustment permitted under law, which is 3%. The difference of 2.4% is multiplied by the retirement benefit payments up to a maximum of $22,947.11 for the one year period ending August 31st, 2021. Now we will move into new parts beginning on page 21, part QQ, adds the Director of Operations to the list of major policy influencing positions within the Department of Administrative and Financial Services. The position request is on page A7 in the supplemental budget document, but we didn't update um, Title V. During the public hearing on February 28th, the Department of Health and Human Services noted that language was necessary to establish and implement a program to provide salary supplements for childcare and early childhood educators providing services directly to children in licensed childcare settings. Part RR on page 22 directs the Department of Health and Human Services to establish and implement a program 
to provide salary supplements for childcare and early childhood educators, providing services directly to children served in licensed childcare settings. The department shall implement a tiered system for the amount of individual salary su supplements by July 1, 2023, and promulgate rules within two years after implementation. This language was erroneously admitted from the governor's 22 supplemental budget and corresponds to the $12 million child care stipend initiative included on page A75 of the supplemental budget document. Part SS on page 23 of the language document directs the Department of Health and Human Services to make supplemental payments to the main veterans homes in fiscal years 2022 and 2023 to offset budget shortfalls. As a condition of receiving the supplemental payments, Maine Veterans Homes must commit to continue providing services in Caribou and Machias. This part aligns with the budget initiative we discussed on page 34. Part TT on page 23 of the language document authorizes the judicial branch to use funds from issuing securities to replace and upgrade ventilation systems in Presque Isle, Lewiston, Rockland, Skowhegan, and West Bath facilities. We discussed part UU on page 24 earlier. As a reminder, this part requires a transfer of $3 million on or before June 30th, 2022 from the unappropriated surplus to, of the general fund to the Department of Marine Resources Bureau of Policy and Management Lobster Fisheries Litigation Fund, other special revenue fund account to support litigation costs in defense of the state's lobster fishery. Part VV on page 25 allows the state treasurer and state controller to establish non-immediate payment procedures through routine technical rules rather than major substantive, enabling the departments to make these changes more quickly and efficiency, efficiently. The purpose of this initiative is to create an efficient process by which departments within state government may utilize specialized third-party payment services. Examples of these include the Bureau of General Services seeking to utilize eBay for the purpose of selling surplus state property, or the Division of Support Enforcement seeking to collect cash child support payments through major retailers like Walmart, CVS, and Dollar General. Since these payment processes have delays of up to three days between payment from the customer and receipt of funds by the state, current statute requires major substantive rulemaking, whereas the language presented before you would change that to routine technical. Rules were developed via the major substantive process jointly by the Office of State Treasurer and the Office of State Controller in 2019 and 2020, but ultimately went unapproved due to the COVID shortened legislative process. In 2021 and 2022, the process was done again with approval by the legislature, but, missed, but we missed a publishing date. No comments were ever received during either process. Routine technical will also allow the treasurer and controller to adapt to any changes in payment processing. The delay in adoption has kept agencies from pursuing new and innovative payment processes and has kept us from modernizing our systems to keep up with new options for citizens. These rules are not controversial, they promote administrative efficiency, and I hope the committee sees the wisdom in allowing them to be implemented in the near term. Part WW on page 26 establishes the Emergency Housing Relief Fund within Maine State Housing Authority and directs the state controller to transfer 2020, transfer 22 million to that fund. The funds may be used to provide rental assistance, supplement other programs addressing the needs of the homeless or those facing other immediate housing needs, supplement other short-term rental assistance programs, create additional supportive housing along the housing first model for people with disabilities, mental health or substance use disorders, and support other uses that will address the immediate housing emergency challenges facing the state. The last piece of language is part XX. We covered this language earlier when discussing the allocation to the fund to address PFAS contamination on page eight of the change package. TBD on delivery. This concludes my testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Figueroa. Um, would you like to take a break before we start with questions from the committee? 
No, I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Um, are there any questions from the committee for the commissioner? Representative first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm looking in my notes of what page I want to reference, but it has to do with the matching funds that the Rue Institute and the University of Maine um, would receive. I understand that each of them are part of the finalist round, so to speak, of a national program. And I would assume that one could get it and the other could not. They're not tied to each other, at least they don't appear to be. And then should they not get the, when do you know the date of when they might be notified? Should they receive the full package, so to speak, and would need this match? And if not, I'm happy to get that at a later date. Well, I'll find out the date. The match commitment needed to be made in order for them to proceed to the second round as when those decisions are gonna be made, I, I'll find that out. And, you. and you're right, they do appear to be separate and distinct from each other. Thank you. Um, I have a question about UMaine, back to, um, since we're on UMaine. Um, on page 49, where you are uh, appropriating $3 million in FY23 for research commercialization, is that ongoing or one time? That is ongoing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Hymanson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is about the targeted case management. Um, that's $2 million. I think in, in the bills that came forward, $6 million seemed to be the number. And I, so I wondered about the federal match on the $2 million. and what it pays for and what it doesn't pay for. Appreciate that. Thank you. Representative Cloutier. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I have a couple of questions. I might be jumping around to different places. Um, so I'll start with the details on the new housing, emergency housing relief fund. Um, and the lane, I just wanna confirm that that's an additional 22 million to what was proposed in the supplemental budget around the, um, technical assistance and the grant program. Yes, this okay. is an additional. Uh, and then also the language where it says any other use that will address the immediate housing emergency facing the state. I just wanna confirm that that would include new construction and rehab of units. It's possible, yes, that okay. these funds could be used for that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then my second question relates to the relief checks. So some of the questions that I've been getting from constituents uh, relate to folks who don't typically file a tax return. Um, and so my understanding is that they would just file a tax return to be able to, to access the, the funds. Um, but also what um, plans the department and administration might have for outreach to those folks so that they know that they have to do that. Um, would be helpful. And then lastly, on the opportunity main tax credit, um, I just want to confirm that the only difference between what was proposed in the change package and what was in the supplemental is that increase from $2,000 to 2,500. Okay, so the relief check tax return question, that that is correct, that's the way to the easiest way for the state to confirm eligibility and process a payment. And, um, and a sentence that we would say around filing a tax return is that there may be other credits that these people are eligible for. And so um, our outreach effort will talk about this particular check, but also those programs like property tax fairness and sales tax credit, uh, fail, sales tax fairness credits. Um, we are, uh, as part of this effort, we will be coordinating with the Maine Municipal Association, libraries, town offices, um, to let people know they have, they have an opportunity to file until October and we'll be able, we'll be sure to let people know that. Um, but that outreach is currently being developed and we can tell you more information. And of course we'll use our legislators um, as well and can give you some information that you'll be able to pass on to your constituents. The 
only change in the student loan debt relief program is from $2,000 to $2,500 per year. I just have a follow-up question to Representative Cloutier's about that opportunity main um, change. Are you familiar with the tax? There was a group on the tax committee that rep that recommended a uh, slightly different treatment of folks who have the benefit now with STEM degrees and to treat them slightly differently going forward to sort of ramp that down for those folks. Are you familiar with that? Um, I didn't know that it became, I knew, I know about the discussions. Okay. I wasn't I, sure it became an official proposal. Well, it, it hasn't. Oh, so my question is, do you have any idea of what the fiscal, the price tag on that would be when those discussions come, came up? Did you do, was there any legwork around what that would cost, that what that proposal would cost? So I think it depends on what we decide as a proposal. Yeah, um, sure. But um, the, the discussions, uh, the governor does recognize the discussions around that grandfathering. Um, mm -hmm. But the proposal was to stop one program and create another. And so instead of trying to figure out how to support the 13,000 through some transition of which some of it might be covered by those credits, um, which are allowed to, will allow to be accrued up to the five years, um, was instead increasing the dollar amount for all of the the participants of the new program, which is estimated to be like 55,000 and geographically will cover the state in a different way than the current program, but does impact those grandfathered people by reducing their benefit to a higher amount versus the lower 2000 amount. That costs $13 million additional for the proposal that we're doing. So between 2000 and 2500 in the benefit is 13 million. Yeah, okay. Was there something you want to ask about that? Um, yeah, could I ask? Yeah. yeah, just to dig in a little deeper, it would be helpful um, as we go forward in work sessions, if there was a way to articulate the thirty two, the 13,000 people in range of how much they're receiving. I don't know if that's possible. I'm assuming yeah. that's possible. I think that I think that question might already be out there and that we're working on that. I can say that the reason that we initially picked $2,000 was that that's the average benefit of the program. Now that's the average, right? Regardless, I'm not specifically talking about a refundable credit versus a credit, but the average benefit was $2,000. Um, for some of those grandfathered people, the impact is the fact that if you have a STEM degree, you're getting a refundable credit that might be more than that $2,500. But the proposal in this would allow 55,000 people to get a refundable tax credit. But yes, I think that question is, is currently being researched. Thank you. Representative Corey, you have a question? Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here today, Commissioner. Um, initially, when I asked why we left out 56,000 filers from the inflation relief payments, um, I was told that um, we could make those payments more impactful or meaningful for as many Mainers as possible. I sort of got that then. Um, at that time, the payment was 510, which is not that far off the 560 that the average Maine person will need to endure per our state economist. Um, We're now talking about $850 per payment, almost $300 over the infl economic inflation impacts the average Mainer will feel. Um, while I'm for returning money, um, even increasing payments to many Mainers, I'm not sure why this was not expanded to the 56,000 Mainers left out when um, more money became available. Is there a plan to help out these taxpayers that are impacted by the cost of inflation as well? So the 56,000, you mean because there's an income eligibility requirement? Okay. So, um, no, the income eligibility stays the same as what was proposed in the supplemental budget. And um, the 560 is more than 560. The 560 is 200, we're just showing 260 for groceries and $300 for oil and gas. But 
the impact will be more than that in other areas, but we just were able to highlight the grocery and oil impact. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Your testimony actually says the governor's proposal comes um, as the Office of State Economist estimates that inflation will cost the average main person more than 560. I guess it says more than 560 than last year, but is there a number that puts that at 850 or is that? Um, I, I'll, I will check. The numbers that I had were the 300 and the 260 for groceries and oil. Thank you. I just love to get it to all in our spot. Yeah. Um, thanks. Uh, Representative Martin. Thank you. Bring your attention back to Part SS, Main Veterans Home. Has the Main Veterans Board made a commitment that if they get the money, they will continue operation of those two operations? That is my understanding, yes. And at, in any of that discussion, I also disclosed that they also had been considering closing South Paris as well? I'm not aware of that discussion. Okay, thank you. Representative Millett. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner, following up on Representative Corey's questions about Part L and the new language, um, there are three references to deadlines for, first of all, transferring the monies, uh, the total of 682 million um, out of the general fund to the OSR accounts on or before June 30th of the current year. I understand that deadline and how it would be put into two different fiscal years for drawdown purposes. And then when I get into the, the timing of making the payments, while there is language that talks about as soon as administratively possible, it does seem that the one deadline says by June 30th of, of 2023, the assessor shall make $850 relief payments to each eligible Maine citizen, which is a year from this coming June 30th. And, um, and another one that says that uh, the eligibility issue will be decided on or before December 31 of 22. I understand part of that may be because of the extended filer uh, period. But I, I just wonder if I'm misreading the issue of as soon as administratively possible um, with those deadlines that seem to carry into the end of this calendar year, even into the end of the next fiscal year. Yeah. Is there, is there a, a way to read this quickly and aggressively from your perspective as the author and as, as you and the governor intend it to work? How soon would these payments be transferable uh, if enacted, if the L language are enacted as, as requested? Yeah, so that the answer to that is as soon as administratively feasible, but no later than June of 2022, MRS will start issuing payments. The 20, June 2023 reference is they will make all of those payments. And then similar to the $285 checks, some of them come back. And so we have to research and resend the payment out. The one year timeline is we'll do our best to get those payments out to people by then. And if we don't, we'll transfer the money over to the unclaimed property so that they'll be able to get it from that. So that's the one year. The December, um, this, the December 22 deadline is uh, we start issuing payments as soon as possible, but no later than December 31st. And that is because of the cleanup of people that might not file until October 31st. So there are a number of dates in there. Okay. So that it, as soon as administratively possible language still is the guiding language for um, early transfers, yes. as, you, as you interpret it. Um, Commissioner, you and I had had conversations during the hearing and then uh, last Friday on the briefing about the opportunity to avoid the administrative costs of printing checks, mailing envelopes, and including various other communications in the way in which the program was administered last year. Um, and I think the, the metaphor kicking the tires in terms of the numbers of filers who use a direct deposit um, routing number was discussed. Are you any closer to being able to talk about 
the extent to which you think these transfers could be made electronically um, on a sooner than uh, mailed basis um, and what portion of the eligible filer population might fit into that category? So my answer to that is I can talk more about it, but I'm not, we're not ready to say whether we can or can't use the electronic um, option. Um, I'm sure MRS already knew this, but I've now been educated that about half of the filers, about 400,000 ish filers give us bank information to receive their returns electronically. So, right. So some component of the checks would have to be checks. Um, the second part of that that I've learned is that um, I'm trying to remember, I have notes, like 49,000 of those have changed their bank account information since the la last time they filed. And our thought was that we maybe want to make sure that somebody has used the same bank for more than just one year to make sure. Um, I know that we talk about some administrative costs of sending checks and letters. But if we send a payment to the wrong account, uh, it, will, it will never come back. It's, um, so that would be a loss. And then there's another percentage of people that use the pay ahead program from like tax filer opportunities. So the tax filer will pay the person their estimated tax. And then when they get their refund, the um, electronic data information is actually back to the tax filer, not to the person. So we would need to make sure, which we, which we can see those, but we'd need to make sure that we're sending it to a person and not the tax filer. So the work that's happening now is how much programming will need to happen in order for us to use the electronic uh, in, instead of the check. And the check process is something that we know and can touch. And so there's still work ongoing for that. There's still going to be some process uh, programming that needs to happen for the check option, which I'm just going to take an opportunity because I know you all would be sad if I didn't. The old systems that the state has to use to, to do its work, um, make it such that sometimes people don't well, you just did a $285 program. Can't you just change the amount to $850? Take off a couple of those things that you had on it and do it again. I mean, I, I wish that the answer to that was yes, but the answer is not exactly. Because any changes that we've made to that system since the last time we did something make the system different. So I've kind of been using that game of operation where you go in with the tweezers and you try not to touch the sides like assuming everything is the same, then you can insert the tweezers again and not touch the sides. But our system has already changed since the time we did those taxes. So where you'd be inserting the tweezers has changed. And so it's possible that you'll touch the sides. So I have asked MRS and I believe that they will do everything that they can to get them out as quickly as possible. They know the, the importance of that and we all do, um, but they're hesitant to confirm you know, out further than or prior to 60 days. So that's the, you know, we changed the date from July to June because of that. Um, and they are starting some of that work. And so that is that update, but I, I'll give more of an update on the electronic part as people start diving into that. Thank you, Commissioner. And what you just said is consistent with what you said earlier. So my recollection was last Friday, you mentioned that of the current filers, the 800,000 that we start with, approximately 300,000 of them have been electronically having refunds deposited to a routing number, although that may change for changes in their demographic and also the uh, assistance they might get from, from tax filings. I wondered as I thought about this, and this, this is maybe just a question and suggestion that MRS look at, other files that are available to all of us around the table uh, who get our legislative biweekly payments to a de direct deposit account. Um, my understanding that the payrolls for all state employees are similarly done now. 
maybe some exceptions there you can clarify, and that the pool of retirees, both teachers and state employees, by and large, are using direct deposit. I'm wondering if MRS and your controller and others could be looking at those existing files above and beyond the income tax files, just to see if we can cut through some of the administrative costs, the paperwork and the delays by getting more and more of the inflation related money in the hands of the people that are struggling the most, um, hopefully well in advance of even June 30th of 22. Um, I'm just making those suggestions. I, I would look forward in a work session to conversation with the people that know the database much better than I do. The one thing that I will say about that, besides saying I want to, as much as I complain about the old systems, I do want to say thank you. In this particular case, we are working to replace our tax systems, thanks to some certificate of participation borrowing that you authorized. Um, but what the, uh, the one thing that I will say about that, and it's probably it's definitely a good suggestion that we can look into, is that now you've just got one rickety database talking to another rickety database, but it's worth exploring. Can I ask, a, I'd like to ask a follow up to that. Um, obviously there's some, um, in this day and age, doing a paper check in an envelope with postage um, can seem archaic and burdensome, but I think what I'm hearing is that the administration and MRS feels like that's the most reliable way to get the money to the people we want the money to go to because of our outdated um, information systems and the fact that tax filers change banks, they change people they use to file their taxes and that there's sort of inherent change in the electronic records. Um, so I guess my question is, 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 it, is, is it your position that mailing a paper check is going to be in the long run the best way to get the money to the folks whose uh, money we're returning? I, I mean, I, I, yes, that's where we started and that's, how, that's what we know. Um, but I want to explore the other options so that we can make sure that, right, because we understand the importance, but that is what we know and we know how to process checks that get returned and, and do that work. Um, so, but I'll know more for sure as we continue just to, like, like we said, kick the tires. Thank you. Representative Purse? Just, just to ask another question around that. If we were, if you did the, if you found out that we possibly could do these other scenarios, would that slow down the entire process in and of itself and create a longer delay in either getting it through your electronic filing or your mail? That's, that's, a, that's the fear. That's the programming conversation that we're having now. Because once you pay somebody in one way, you've got to make sure you're not going to pay them in the other way. So, um, that's the conversation that we're having now. Just... Any other questions for the commissioner? Representative Arata. Thank you. Um, moving on, <laughs> the uh, Mill Commission, I noticed that looks like a significant decrease. Are there, um, this is on page six. Um, what implications are there from this de decrease for the main Milk Commission? We will get that answer for you. <laughs> That's fine. And also um, regarding language part XX, the PFAS issue. Um, so in the testimony it says, yes, this is a very complex issue. Science and federal policy is not caught up with. Um, so along that line, I'd like to suggest that this advisory committee be comprised of mainly of PhDs, people who hold PhDs in the natural sciences. This should, I mean, it doesn't appear to be um, political at this point, and we want to keep it that way. We definitely don't want this to be, have any um, political leanings, I would say. We just want experts, people who understand 
um, physiology, biochemistry, chemistry, all the, the science, you know, we want experts from various uh, sciences. I just, I know you haven't finalized the language yet. So that that's just some input that I'm giving. Thank you. Yes. Representative Fay. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to, to follow up on that question, um, my question was, it, do you envision Part X intersecting with LD 2013 and in, in the way that the Ag Committee passed it after those conversations? The language of Part XX will be that language in 2013. Thank you. And I believe that that's part of the, they were working on it this morning. Do you have, do we have it in? Oh. Yeah. Representative so Faye, was that a unanimous report out of that committee? I believe it was a unanimous yeah. report out of that committee okay. and I was listening as they were deliberating it. It is co complex and complicated and I think they just passed it late last week, so. Yep, that is the language. Any other questions for Commissioner Figueroa? Okay, I'm not seeing any, but thank you. As you know, more will come up. So we'll be sending them your way as they do. Yes, I should um, say that some you did ask some questions while we were testifying on the supplemental and we were we are working on that 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 should be to you this week. Sure. The answers to those. So as far as uh, so thank you for joining us. Thank Michelle. you. Um, and as far as appropriations is concerned, uh, we are caucusing and beginning to uh, I'll say for our caucus beginning to uh, compile lists of initiatives we're ready to vote on one way or another. Um, we do have a work session on Wednesday and um, Maureen, would you mind just reading the committee report backs that we're gonna be addressing on Wednesday to certain people? It's, a, it's actually along this, it might be easier to say the ones you aren't, but um, criminal justice and public safety, education and cultural affairs, energy and utilities, criminal just, oh, got that twice, good. You're gonna do that twice. Uh, <laughs> inland fisheries and wildlife, uh, the innovation development, economic advancement and business, judiciary, labor and housing, marine resources, state and local government, and veterans and legal affairs. And just, just to remind the uh, public, you'll be using the report backs um, for your references when you vote and the report backs will all, by the time, if they haven't already, they'll be on posted on the, your committee website. Thank you. Anything else, Maureen, before we, um, oh, go ahead. All set. Representative Millett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a question of uh, expectations material we've just gone over, will it go back to the policy committees or should we continue in our caucusing work to review these pieces as well? I think we should continue to review these pieces and check back with the policy committees as needed. So there will be a communication to the policy committees to review the change package? Um, possibly, I, um, I don't know if we've nailed that down, but we can certainly discuss that at our chairs and leads meeting and, fig and figure that out. Any other questions before we adjourn? All right. Thank you all. Have a nice afternoon. See you Wednesday back here.